Grace be multiplied to all of you in peace from Jesus Christ and from God the Father who raised him from the dead. The text to which we want to give attention is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 24, at the 12th verse. The Lord says this, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Now let's pray. Lord, set our feet on solid ground and let your words go with us in all our ways. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, may your name, O Lord, be praised. Amen. Please take your seats. In the holy name of Jesus, treasured brothers and sisters, one and all of you, fellow worshipers with me of the great Easter Lord. It's a trendy word, spirituality is. So you can read lots of articles about First Nations spirituality or about Eastern spirituality. And there are those moments when church leaders even talk of Christian spirituality and sort of give the impression that it's just another spirituality flavor, almost like one of the dozens of flavors you can choose from when you go down to the ice cream parlor. I'll be honest with you, there are those times when talk about spirituality strikes me like an academic lecture, because if you are not careful, Discussing spirituality can almost make you treat God as if he were just an object over on a table somewhere to be dealt with, an idea up on the blackboard, the kind of thing that you can hold at arm's length so that it does not get too personal or make anybody squirm. Spirituality is not doing the talking in the text I just read. Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ uttered these words, Jesus Christ gets right into your face with them, and he aims every one of them at you. He puts his finger here on concrete stuff that you must wrestle with as I must too. Disquieting as this may be, and it is, he speaks here to show you the way to freedom, and he speaks to heal so many of the things that get dislocated in your personal life and in the life of our beloved churches. So I'm asking you to hear him speak now as we try to collect our thoughts a little bit around this theme that I've decided to call most, but not all. It's a painful truth that Jesus aims at you here. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. He's not just talking about this wicked witch of the West type wickedness, the kind of thing that we used to watch as children on the Wizard of Oz, you know, where flying monkeys took off with Dorothy's little dog, or where the witch cast a spell on Scarecrow, Lion, and Tin Man, the kind of thing that might scare the bejabbers out of you when you're eight years old in your living room, but which you never, ever see in real life. Because after all, wickedness somehow sounds like such a harsh, old-fashioned word. It doesn't fit the kind of refined and civilized people that we Canadians have become. The truth is, it fits us all too well. Because this particular wickedness is the lawless mindset that tries to knock down God and his will, and it tramples other people in the process. It's this self-absorbed attitude that figures, well, as long as I'm comfortable with it and my needs are being met, that's pretty much the only thing that matters. If you keep your eyes peeled, you'll see it on the rise all around you. You see it in road rage when you get out there in the car on the highway. You see it sometimes in the brusque way that people behave with their little shopping carts in the aisles at a place like Walmart, especially in the weeks leading up to Christmas. You see it in how growing numbers of people in the public forum never seem to be able to find their way to polite speech anymore or give somebody else the benefit of the doubt because they're so busy shouting and making demands and in some cases maybe even backing up their shouts with signals involving use of the middle finger, if you know what I'm saying. 
You see it in large numbers of old people sitting forgotten for days or sometimes even weeks on end in a nursing care facility without a visit, despite the fact that they have loved ones in town who could come and brighten their day if they just cared enough to do it. The Holy Christian Church is stung by this kind of wickedness, and not just out there in the world either. We see it in our own midst, in settled congregations, in solid Lutheran families, in church institutions of higher learning, on our mission fields, and that's only a very abbreviated list. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. It doesn't happen all at once. It creeps in little by little so that it's easy not to notice. It comes in gradually and it's tough to put your finger on even though you may have the vague sense that things aren't quite right. Drifts in over time and looks therefore like a natural development and as a result, we kind of get used to it and we don't see it anymore as a sin to be tackled head on. The love will grow cold, Jesus says. Oh, there will still be plenty of talk about love and voices claiming that that's what they're motivated by. There will be no lack of people trying to justify things that violate God's holy will by saying that love is what stands behind it. That bogus love, however, is really just another form of giving in to the self-centeredness that Jesus warns about here. Agape will grow cold, he says. Those preacher types, especially those with a long history behind them, and I have to say I'm one of them, <laughs> may remember at this moment in those green-covered commentaries how Dr. Lenski used to, used to uh, uh, define agape love. Sounds a little bit uh, uh, dusty to start with, but I'll help you with it. He called it the love of intelligent comprehension and corresponding purpose. Now let me unpack that in real English. That means... It's the kind of love which identifies what is really good for another person, not necessarily what's easy for the other person or even what the other person wants, but which identifies what's really good for the other person and then works very consciously and targetedly to bring about that good. It isn't always easy to practice this kind of love. And to be honest with you, it isn't always pleasant to be on the receiving end of this kind of love. But this agape love, the real solid thing, is the one that Jesus wants you to have. And this agape love, he tells you, is the kind that's being threatened more and more as we move toward the end of all things. When St. Matthew records this warning that Jesus brings, it's not just an ancient word on paper. And he isn't just identifying a problem in a faraway place or some theoretical thing. You see it happening in front of your eyes. And I do too. The love of most will grow cold. There's no nice way to say it. The cold is widespread. It lays hold of great numbers of people in the world. And Jesus tells you it also besets many, many believers. I don't think it's hard to picture how this might work. When the self-centered mindset that discards God's will gets very, very prevalent, you can come to the point where it feels just like too much bother to keep caring and to keep patiently admonishing and to keep trying to set things right when you see that thing rear its head so relentlessly in other people. When the self-centered mindset becomes a very standard way that people operate, you can also convince yourself that it's reasonable when you're tempted to do the same. The love of most will grow cold. It's tough to hear because Jesus' word is not hard to understand, is it? The cold will be widespread, very widespread. But if you listen really well, there's sunshine in this verse. The cold's widespread, all right, but it's not total. Jesus never once says the love of all will grow cold. And he does not tell you that there's no agape love to be found. It might be rare, all right. But love, the true thing, is strong and real 
and it's there. It burns hot for you every day of your life in the heart of your Savior Jesus himself. Streams right at you from the holy five wounds of God's Lamb who let wicked men nail him to a piece of wood and then died alone in the sunshine all for your sake. That love bursts from the tomb where the risen one cracked the door right open and walked out of the cemetery alive after he had beat the stuffings out of death and hell. That redeeming love keeps coming your way from the pages of your own Bible and from the preaching of Christ's good news, sending blood-bought pardon to your doorstep day by day and year after year. It's agape, the real thing, this rare love that Jesus brings to you through the cold. It's not cheap talk about love. It's not bogus love that goes around calling itself acceptance while just leaving you where you were before, unforgiven and unhealed and distant from God. But it's the real thing this warm Christ love is because it actually takes hold and rescues you, an undeserving sinner, and brings you back to God again, pardoned, changed, and made new. The love of most will grow cold. Not all love will. The agape that Christ can kindle in the hearts of his believing sons and daughters is rare too in this frigid world of ours. You don't run into it often, alas. But it is there. It's very real. It's an emotional experience for me to come back to Ontario because I know what I'm talking about when I say this because I have received this love very personally from many of you whose faces I have in front of me at this moment. And I know that you also have experienced personally from some of the brothers and sisters who are sitting close to you in this assembly. You've also received it from other people who are not here with us this evening, but are part of Synod's wonderful family scattered across the country, just as you have received it from followers of Christ who have no particular tie to our church at all. We understand, of course, that this word that Jesus speaks is not the typical stuff that leaders, even church leaders, would generally use to motivate people at the start of a convention. But it is a deep sign of his burning love that he would be willing to speak this kind of word to you. His love means business. It's deep. At first blush, of course, the text may sign, so sound almost completely negative because it bumps some of our typical cheerleading right off the path. But when it does that, it clears the way for you to see Jesus as your only refuge. He was throbbing with agape love when he spoke this haunting word. It came on Holy Week Tuesday, I guess, when he was just about to lay down his life as a ransom for many. Said this, he did, while he was getting ready to go to his death to redeem you from all wickedness. In other words, to redeem you from this self-centered mindset that ignores God's law and will. And he also died, as St. Paul told Titus, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, actually eager to do what's good. We sing about that in an old hymn like Rock of Ages, don't we? We ask Jesus in a song like that, Be for sin the double cure, save me from its guilt and power. And he's done exactly that, folks. He died to wipe away the debt that you racked up before God with the self-centered mindset and the lawless acts, yes, let's take off the gloves and call it wickedness, that flow from that mindset. He also died to loosen its stranglehold on you so that you can rise above this tidal wave that's making the love of most run cold, so that God gets his chance to kindle agape in you that might be rare all right, but which is so real and so sorely needed in this frigid world of ours. In this sober word, the love of most will grow cold. Jesus comes very near and offers himself to you so that you can run to him and hide yourself in him, the great love refuge for this cold moment. And in this haunting word, he also points to the rare thing that you can do now with the agape that he sets on fire inside of you. 
He opens the door for you to warm up the cold with your own gracious speaking, with your willingness to put your preferences into second place and be inconvenienced big time, with your readiness to listen and enter into somebody else's world rather than to have to do so much of the talking all the time, with your displaying of a gospel temperament, if I could call it that, the kind of thing that St. Paul was talking about when he said, I've been crucified with Christ, and the result is that I'm not doing the living here anymore. Christ is doing the living in me. It's a call for this hour, brothers and sisters. In your home congregation, for example, where you've got the chance now to move beyond small talk and just a real shallow, hi, how are you, in the narthex on the way in and out of services on Sundays. As you enter into the lives of other people and see yourself as Christ's radiator to help fellow believers keep warm in the cold that's surrounding them. It's a call that goes straight into the ranks of our pastors where brothers in the ministry can stand by each other with a special warmth since they understand their friends' challenges in a way that nobody else quite can. It's a call that can shape how you treat the president and other leaders of this district who, to put, put it frankly, can suffer rather badly sometimes at the hands of people who are very, very quick to write and call if they find something to criticize, but who can be almost totally silenced in some cases when it's needed to speak a word of love or appreciation or understanding. It's always going to be a needed word in a church like ours, isn't it? Which is right to stress sound teaching and a very clear confession, but at times neglects things like patience and forbearance and the eyes to see other people as a chance to pass on the agape that comes to you directly from the one who bled and died for us. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Most, not all. Because the real agape love is such a rare treasure in our world, and often even in God's church, it really stands out, doesn't it? You and I, I think, hardly grasp what a powerful force it can be. It can help your local church, for example, become a warm and nurturing place where longtime members are held close to Christ through thick and thin and where new people actually want to come and get themselves rooted. It can give to our preachers an authenticity that will command respect without having to demand respect and can help their hearers accept their words even when they have tough things to say because people have already been touched by the heart which says them all. And just as unbelievers were amazed when they looked at the early Christians and said, see how they love each other, your agape and my agape can make an impression on people around us, particularly when they come to understand that we only have it because we're hooked up to the Christ who gives to people treasures they cannot get anywhere else. Maybe you think it's a little bit strange that the president isn't preaching on that great theme that we initiated last June at the Hamilton Synodical Convention for this triennium from Psalm 36 in the ninth verse, in your light we see light. The fact is I am preaching on it because in tonight's text, your Savior Jesus comes near to shine light on what we're up against, to shine light on the church's weaknesses in many places, and especially to shine light on himself, what only he can give you and what he's ready to do with you. Dear ones, don't let us ever, ever, ever be content to talk about him but instead open your arms very wide and embrace this one who comes near, even though I realize he's saying a word which at first is kind of hard to hear. He is with us in the winds that are blowing hard and cold in this world of ours and sometimes even in the church. He gives us undeserved the love that holds us tight and can really warm things up in our own midst and from there, right out into the world where he asks you 
to live. Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Amen.